Okay, we know that there's a difference between GDP, real GDP and nominal, but let's just go back about what GDP is. What is GDP count? Domestic, domestic. All final domestic. goods and services within a year domestically produced, right? Within a nation's borders, right? Okay, we said nominal GDP. Inflation. That has inflation. We are going to look at real GDP and what do they calculate out? Inflation. inflation. And so we're going to go back through the math because a lot of times AP will give you simplified worlds like this to be able to calculate GDP, because you know you don't get a calculator on the test. So for us to calculate nominal, all we have to do is take the quantity times the price. So crackers times the quantity of two, that gives us two. Toast times the quantity of two gives us four. Cheese, three times two, that gives us what? And then I'm going to total this up so I can get the GDP for 2015, and that gives me what? 12. 12. Now let's go to the next one. All I do for nominal is multiply across quantity times price. So what's this first one? 2. 2. What's the next one? 5. What's the next one? 6. When I total this up, what does it give me? 16. No, not 16. 13. 13. 13. 13. 13. 13. 13. Okay, again, let's do the nominal for 2017. What's this first one? 3.3. 3. Okay, what's the next one? 7.5. And then it's, next one is 10.50, right? That gave me a total basket for that GDP of what? 21.3. 0. 0.3, right? Okay, that was hard for me to get that three. So, all, I know we did it right here, but this is what it was asking us to do. Just set it up, there it is. We've done nominal GDP. So to determine nominal GDP, all you do is you multiply the quantity times the price. Well, we wanna calculate the real. To calculate the real, we take the current year times the price of the base year. So let's just look at this. If I were to do that, make 2015 my base year, and take that price times that quantity, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get the same number. So my first year is 12. Okay, but 2016, I need to go back and take the base year price of what? Okay, so of 2015, so I know it's one, two, and three, times the quantity of 2016. So my quantity in 2016 is two, 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 right? So now I multiply across, what do I get? Two, four, six. What does that give me for this total? Was there really much inflation? No. The quantity and the prices stayed the same, okay? Let's look at 2017. But I have to take the base year only from the previous year, right? So my new base is what? 2016 and the price is one, 2.5, three. But I'm gonna take the quantity from 2017 and the quantity is three, three, three. Okay, so when I multiply this out, I get Is there a dramatic wait, wait, increase? No, no, no. Wait, wouldn't you be? Shouldn't you take from 2015 instead of 2016? No, but I can only compare from the year before. Oh. Yeah, it should be 1945. Because you can't jump years. You have to take from the previous year. If you can only have a base from the year before. So, like, if I were to calculate between like gold prices in 1770 from what it is today, I would have to go year by year by year by year by year. I can't just go all the way from one to another because I have to calculate all those rates of inflation in between. So you're essentially taking all down inflation? Yes, but you have to go year by year by year by year. Right. Exactly. Okay, so the 
Was this right? 19.5. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so what does this tell me from there to there? I know I took out inflation, but was there a general increase in the price level? Yes. Yes, yes. yes there was a general increase in the price level. From here to here, was there a general increase? No. No, no change, right? So do you all see this a little bit better about GDP? Okay, because we're going to be doing the same thing when we look at what consumers spend and how do consumers start issues. So on this next one, we're going to try to calculate um, the growth of GDP comparing year to year. Okay? And what I'm going to use here is I use my real GDP and my calculations. So for 2015, I take the new value, 12, minus the old value, 12 over 12 times 100, and that gives me what? And then when I had this new number, right, I did 12 minus 12 over 12 times 100. That gave me? Yeah. Now, this is the 19. one where it gets, I have to use the new value. What's my new value? 19.5 minus 12, which is my old value, over my 12 times 100. I'm recording this, so I don't have a calculator. Um, 62.5%. Is that correct? No. Sorry, it probably was. I just it is. <laughs> Is anybody checking his math? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Right. Oh, okay. He's right. It's 62.5. Do y'all see that? Okay. Let's flip to the other side. Let's try this again just for good measure. Because I didn't make this homework. I just said we would do it over as a review. Are y'all okay that it isn't homework? Yes. yes. Okay. Because I figured I could capture y'all today. So... On this next one, I want y'all to try this one just to do nominal. You already know what to do for nominal. Multiply it out, get me a total. Multiply it out and get me a total. Most of y'all have phones that have calculators, right? Okay. Because I hold I bought a whole new set of calculators for the test when we if we have to do it on certain things. Y'all done your all's nominal GDP? Why did they make it backwards? What? They put the quantity first. Yeah, they oh. did. I'm sorry. That was me. 2.5. I mean, if you multiply them together, you still get the same thing. Okay. There's a dollar value. I, I only want you to do the first one. Oh, big brain here. Okay, so what did y'all get on this one? 15. 15. Oh, Is that correct? Yes. This one? 30. And this one? So what is our coal? 53. Okay, over here. 100. So this is 145, right? Yep. So there we go. We've done our nominal. The next one's going to ask us to calculate the real GDP. Well, I know for 2009 it's going to be what? 53, because I've already done the math. But now I need to take the base here, right? which is going to be what year? 2009. I'm going to take 2.5, 6, and 4. And then I'm going to multiply it times 2010 quantity. 8, 10, and 5. 8, 10, and 5. Do this math. So what did 
you'll get 20, 60, 20, which is equal to, was there, was there an increase? Yes. Okay. So let's calculate the growth. Well, this one's going to be easy, right? 53 minus 53 over 53 times 100, that gives me what? Is there any growth? Okay. Well, 100% zero growth. Okay. Next now, I take the new year, 100, minus what? 53 over 53 times 100, which is going to give me 88.6. feel about this math now? Okay, so this has been, a, a lot of times they like to ask the free response um, as something for you to do your GDP nominal and real. So let's look at this first one. It says the output and prices of goods and services in country X are shown in the table above. Okay, it was this table right here. Okay, I made you do the math already. What is the nominal gross domestic product of 2010? Look back at your table. What was the nominal gross domestic product? 145. There's your answer. What is the real GDP in 2010? Wait, didn't we already do this? Yes. What is it? 100. What is GDP? It's the dollar amount of goods and services produced within a country's borders within a given year. Yeah, like, like what you know. like, yeah, what you know. And here it's dollars. Okay. okay. In other nations, it's whatever is based off their money system. Okay. Right. Last time we did do this, right? Yeah, we didn't you know, finish it. Okay, we didn't finish it. Okay. Finish it. okay. Mm -hmm. So identify the two methods of calculating gross domestic product. I could do which one? Income, income which I add all the incomes. It's W plus R plus I plus P, right? Or I could do the spending approach, which is C plus I plus G plus XN. Sorry, my X is my T. It looks like an X. Okay. Explain why the two methods you've identified in part A must yield the same value. Because does the government calculate any of the illegal activity? No. So they basically count the money spent always is going to be minus your money earned, right? Or either way, it goes either way, it will always equal to zero. We did part three. Identify the shortcomings of using GDP as an indicator. What was the shortcomings? Uh, it doesn't count. Transfer, transfer payments. Okay, so this next one, it says if the nominal gross, I should say gross, I don't say it's gross, I don't know, I guess I typed it in wrong. Gross domestic product increased by 4% in 1996. Identify two additional pieces of information that you will need before you can conclude that the living standard of the typical person increased by 4%. Okay, so wait, every time I calculate GDP, what two things oh, am I taking into consideration? Inflation. inflation, I need to know if inflation occurred. I also need to know prices, which deals with this price change, right? Also, GDP, we also said is very dependent on what? Population. The population, those are the two answers. Inflation with the price change in population. So if the population went down, the GDP would go up, right? Yes, because the amount of people you're looking at if you're looking at GDP per capita. Okay. okay. But if our population went up and our GDP went up, would that say that it really increased? No, because we're going to look at that GDP per capita. Okay. So it just depends. I need to figure out the price and the number of population to determine how much did that increase. Okay. Looking at this, was it very hard on the free responses of GDP? No, because they're realizing, can you do this math without a calculator? Kind, Some, of. kind of, the easy ones, right? Like when I looked at the nominal, we could do those. But could I have done this one over here? Yeah. Yeah. It, Maybe. Some of you, if you're the human calculator, yes. 
Okay. So basically, you control. Yes. Well, I mean, dividing dividing two numbers and then moving the decimal over two isn't. Isn't that hard? Yeah. True. But there, so from all of these were actually everything that has been on an AP test of what I could pull from the secured document. Okay. So how do y'all feel about GDP? Good. Okay. So what we're going to look at today is the next part for us, the precursor for me getting into um, CPI, which is going to be another calculation system. But before I can get into it, I have to introduce like what we're looking at nominal was inflation. Are y'all good with this? Yes? It's understanding? It's soaked in after the weekend and when we redid it together? Okay, so eventually I'm going to be getting into talking about CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And we calculated with GDP, like the effects of inflation, right? But what we're going to be looking at is just, there's sound to it, sorry. There is different price instabilities. One of them we just talked about is inflation, a general rise in prices, okay? And when that general rise in prices occurs, what happens to your purchasing power? It goes down, right? Because a lot of your businesses don't come to you. They're like, oh my gosh, there was a 3% inflation. Let me increase your pay by 3%. Do your businesses do that? No. No, okay? They do not do that. Generally, don't career jobs do that? Um, no, okay, and so I'm going to talk about that today, okay? It just depends on how your contract is written and if they have a special provision I'll talk about at the end in your contract, okay? And I'll tell you how to negotiate your contracts, okay? There's deflation, a decline in the general level of price. Do we see that often? No. No. In the depression, yes. But oftentimes our economy is always going up, so we're always going to see a general rise of inflation. Last is disinflation, where there was inflation, but it's not completely eliminated, okay? So inflation in 90, 90, 1996 was about 3.6%, and then in 1997, it went down. So that was a little bit of disinflation, okay? So there's major types of inflation, and we're gonna talk about their causes. The first one, there's a little bit difference here, right? Do y'all see the, what's the difference on this chart? This is a graph. We've graphed this before, but what's the difference? It's the total. Aggregate supply. I'm looking. Do you see the A there? Yeah. So now we're moving to aggregate because we are looking. Let's put up the phone. We are looking at GDP, right? So I'm looking at the whole economy. So every time I'm going to graph now, remember those demand and supply lines? I'm going to now graph them as aggregate. My axes have changed. Do you all see this one? It's now called what? GDP instead of quantity and that used to be price level, but it's now called uh, It used to be called price now. It's called price level. I'm sorry guys <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna look at demand pool inflation Demand pool inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods So in all actuality this graph should be a little bit different But I couldn't get my curves to look as nice as it should. So let me explain how this looks. I have another PowerPoint. <coughs> My aggregate demand curve should look like this, all right? And it tells me stuff, and I'm gonna have another PowerPoint that explains this. When we're in a recession, price level is really low, right? But can we increase output? Yes, right? And so this side of it tells me I'm in a recession. All right? And where my aggregate supply curve intersects tells me aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Where my aggregate demand curve, sorry, I, I put supply and I meant demand. Where I put my aggregate demand curve, that also tells me we're in a recession. I always like for it to be right here. Because right here is where the ideal phase of the expansion is. Because price level hasn't gone up, but we're producing to the max capacity. And the reason why this goes vertical is because you have to think about your businesses. Is there a point where they could be at max production and cannot produce anymore? Yes. yes. And what happens is businesses run on three shifts. 
Okay, I just think of Russell Stover's, right? They bring in their first shift from six to like one. And then they shift over to their midday shift, right? And then they have their night shift, right? They can only produce that max. And this is where it hits. The max that a business and a whole society can produce at. And then if people have too many dollars and they really want that chocolate, but Russell Stover's can only produce here, that price then goes what? Up. And then if it goes up in my aggregate demand, people have a lot of dollars, right? And they really want that chocolate, but those businesses can't produce at this moment anymore. So that's so, showing that price can go up really quickly. It can. So let me give you an example. Um, I guess this was, what was like the hottest toy when y'all were young? The DS. The DS. Nintendo the DS. DS. Legos. Legos. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. At least for Okay, Legos. Okay, let me do this with any toy that you think of like was high demand, right? Claudia, good day, right? So around Christmas time, those items come out, right? Yes. But then what happens to like, I thought about like Hatchimals like three years ago. Everyone in Hatchimals, okay? It's the little thing where you rub it and the egg pops open and there's a little being inside. Like Tickle Me Elmo, do y'all know Tickle Me Elmo? Yes. Hey, that was one of those toys, Nintendo <laughs> DS. Hey, Legos, they actually don't have this, but if it's one of the like collector items Legos, that happens. That all of a sudden during Christmas time, people want that item. Do they have that money to cause the price of it to go up? Yes. Yes, and that's what's gonna shift the aggregate demand curve this way. eBay is a great example of this as well, okay? When people put items out there, can people bid up the price? Yes. And that is too many dollars chasing too few goods. And so when my demand curve intersects right here, what phase of the business cycle does that tell me I'm in? Prices are going up, so I'm in a what? Expansion. Okay, right, do y'all get this? Okay, right, yes. So was that like, is that like how on eBay you can have like a steady price for the whole length of the auction and the last minute the price just skyrockets because there's a bunch of people that all want it. All want it and that's too many dollars chasing too few goods. But you have to see with our business, when I look at this, I'm looking at the whole economy. Our businesses, can they easily go back, Russell Stover's, and create another factory overnight to meet the demand of them? No, no and so this is why this is vertical because we're at max production. Output cannot increase until a year or two from now when they create that extra factory or whatever they need to be able to get it done, right? So do y'all understand? This is a perfect example with cars, okay? When, like when cars are at max production, right? It's gonna, be, um, the price is gonna go up, right? And when the price goes up and they realize, okay, we need to build another factory, they build another factory to create those type of cars this will shift that curve all the way over and then the price will come back down. Are you sticking with me? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So, do y'all see how it's just the price goes up even though we, we should see our output remaining the same. The next one we're gonna look at is called cost push inflation. It deals with the cost of producing a good. So what factors am I looking at? Supply, but the cost of inputs. What inputs am I looking at? So C, E, L, and L. So what is the C? Capital, E, entrepreneur, L, and labor. So let's just look. If the cost of producing, Russell Stover, right? I'm at Russell Stover again. They are making chocolate, right? And the price of chocolate goes up. What's gonna happen to their supply? It goes down. And so we're gonna see when that happens, the price of a good goes up. I can look at the oil embargo. Remember the oil embargo in the 70s? Didn't this happen to all items? Mm -hmm. Yes, but it not only happened with oil, but does oil impact everything else? And so that's why we went into this whole stagflation, high unemployment and high inflation, because if we're producing less, what happens to people's jobs? They lose them. So high unemployment, but do we still have high inflation? This cost push thing leads to stagflation. Yes. Didn't the price of like the newer cars that were coming out in the 70s go down because they were making simpler cars that like didn't take as much 
Yes. Gas and stuff. Yes, yeah, so I'm just talking so, about modern no, day. No, no, so I'm saying like that would be like a, like just kind of an outlier example. Yes. Or something, something that's happening. Yes, a map of Gladwell type of example. Okay, right. so minor causes of inflation. One is the government deficit. It's called the crowding out. And this will not make sense till I get to monetary policy. So just imagine our money supply, eventually I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna explain our money supply and our money supply graph looks like this. It's a straight line, okay? And the reason why it's a straight line is that there's only a set amount of money in our economy, okay? And so if the government is coming in and taking a good chunk of that money supply, how much money supply is left for the American American consumer and business very much not very much right and so the government when they put their hand in the money supply they crowd out everybody else so is that like uh, reserve currency uh, no not reserve like, currency it's just all of the money within the system so like for example in the Great Depression did our government deficit spend did they put their hand in the money pot and take a lot of that money out yes. so that left how much for everybody else not a lot. During the wars, do they do that? They stick their hand in the money jar, take a lot of that money, but what does that do for everybody else? Is there much? Okay, so then when the government takes their hand out, that allows for businesses and consumers, let's put it up. I've asked you twice. When the government takes their hand out, that allows for businesses and consumers to come in, right? And this happened in 2000, and this is why there was the dot-com boom, okay? So I'm gonna get to crowding out and crowding in when I get to monetary policy, okay? The other thing that is gonna cause inflation is the wage price spiral, okay? So when I started working in the fast food industry in like in the 90s, minimum wage was 525. So then by y'all now, it's like seven something, right? Seven okay, but now that your wages have gone up, did the producer also have to increase the price of his goods? Yes. yes. And so this causes, we're gonna increase wages, we're gonna increase prices. We're gonna increase wages, we're gonna increase prices. So this comes to that whole, y'all remember that $15 campaign? Mm -hmm. Increase wages to $15, but the impact would be what's gonna happen to prices. Mm -hmm. They're gonna go up, okay? Cool. $15 an hour is but then, wouldn't it be the same if they increase to fifteen dollars an hour? What's going to happen to prices? So then, did you really get a raise? And you're not going to get the hours that you went wrong. Yes, and what's going to happen is when they increase wages. Remember, we did this. They're going to reduce workers because they don't want to pay for that, and they're going to have more people who are taking on a lot more, and they're going to bring in technology. Hence, car site to go right. Hence those scanners where you scan self-checkout because they're having to pay those higher wages. In California, our servers get paid $12 an hour plus tips because the cost of living is so high. High, exactly. And But that's a wage price spiral. You go sit and there for a meal. Really make it. Yeah, you go sit there for a meal. Isn't the meal a lot more costly? So do y'all get wage price spiral as prices rise, workers want more pay? How would it work if you lived in like, say, Nevada and you worked? Does that make sense? Yeah, the, a lot of people do that. Remember, we were talking about that last time with San Jose. Mm -hmm. and and <laughs> yes, we brought up again. Yes. So, what would be the main solution to the wage price spiral? Again, we're in a market economy, and so because the markets drive it, the prices would be that way. This is why, in a command economy, when I get to China, China tries to, and this is the Trump argument, that they purposely deflate their prices and that we know their standard of living is a lot lower, but they purposely keep their standard, their the prices low because that leads to them to exporting more. And because the cost of living is so expensive in the United States, do we produce a lot of things for export? No, we import more. And so all of this will come into play when I get into my last unit on foreign. And basically to answer your question, it's two things called SID and West. SID means strong dollar, we import, and we have a deficit. And this is what Trump dislikes, that our dollar is so strong that we're going to have to import from other countries that have a lower 
dollar value because we could buy a lot more. You go to Mexico, your dollar buys a lot more, right? Because of that, we have a trade deficit, and he didn't like that. Well, China, however, has a weak dollar, or a weak yen, okay? And so this means they export. That means they have a trade surplus, and he didn't like this, so this is why he started putting all those tariffs on them. But China, which we're gonna look to at when I get into their economy, it is one where the government comes in and any time that their value of their yen is rising, they put more yen out there so it decreases that value so people still buy their goods. And we'll look so, at that when I get into foreign exchange. So basically minimum wage will always be perpetual. Yes, because of the wage price spiral. So I'm gonna talk about how do you get around that, okay? Okay, I have a question. Yes. So if, say you live in California, or you work in California and you live in Nevada, mm -hmm. you would get taxed twice. So yes, because they, really they, they, they tax you federally and they tax you state. Right. And they tax you federally and they tax you state. So that's why many people go across the border and live in Mexico because they're not being taxed. Okay. okay. Move to Canada. 40% of your paycheck's going to be taken away. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Now moving to Canada? What? You got to pay like that. Well, actually, the United States has one of the lowest rates in taxes. Yes. I just, just Which for, I'll eventually show you. I don't show you this curve because this is more micro. There's a thing called the Laffer curve. It looks really weird. Right? They said people, if the government taxed your whole entire income, does the government take any revenue? No, right? So they said that they can't have it. Well, if the government taxed half of your income, more people would be willing to go to work, right? But if the government taxed nothing, you would be willing to go to work, right? Mm -hmm. But is the government taking anything in? No. And so what they try to see is that in many um, socialist countries, the government taxes a lot, but people stay out of the workforce because they know that they're gonna get those benefits. When the government taxes you a lot less, it encourages more people to go into work. Okay, and so in the United States, our Laffer curve, this is something that's more of microeconomics, we don't need to know it for macro, but there's a whole graph that goes over the amount of tax. If they tax you more, the less likely people are gonna be work, but you also get provided a lot more social services, right? But the less they tax you, the more likely you're gonna go to work, but the less social services you'll get in exchange, and that's just the Laffer curve. So lastly, excessive monetary growth. The money supply is growing faster than the GDP, and this a lot has to deal with the Fed, and I will have to talk about that in our next unit, Unit 4. Right? So the effects of inflation, um, your purchasing power decreases. Before inflation, you were buying a lot more after. Y'all probably heard this argument from your parents, right? Back in the day, I used to get this for 25 cents. I could buy three of them for this one price we're buying today. Also, um, people start buying luxury goods, okay? We're gonna see the distribution of income is altered. We are gonna see that when inflation occurs, lenders are hurt. When inflation happens, people have now more money, but is it the same value of what they lend out? No. And we're gonna see borrowers are helped because when inflation occurs, they have more money to pay back the debt. And this goes back to the argument of the populist party. I know I was gone last year during the Populist Party stuff, but the Populist Party were arguing that we should coin silver, right? Mm -hmm. If we coin silver, what did that do with the money supply? Okay. It would increase it, causing what? Inflation, and would they be able to pay back their money? Yeah. Yes, because there's a lot more money in the supply, so they could pay off their debt, but those lenders, did they like that? No, because no, they're getting paid back in dollars that are actually worth less than what they lent out, okay? We will see this when I get to monetary policy. So it's like policy. lending out a dollar that's worth a dollar. dollar and, and then inflation dollar occurs where inflation cents. goes up 50%. So you lent a dollar out, but now they're paying you back in 50 cents, okay? Well, let's just say it was quadruple that. You lent out a dollar, and now they're paying you back in quarters. And so this is what the populace wanted. They wanted inflation because there would be more money around and they would have more money to pay off their debt, but is that lender getting the same amount back? No. And it, that's why lenders charge interest. Exactly. Right. 
Oh wait, did I do this one? Your real wages um, of workers decrease, and so when inflation occurs, you can't buy as much, right? So what do you ask for? A raise, because your real wages went down. There's a decrease in savings because as inflation occurs, you're now being pinched and you're having to dip into your savings. Um, there's two ways we'll measure inflation. One is CPI, which we'll use in this course. Um, the other one, PPI, they use that in micro, so we don't have to worry about that. But going back to Colton's question, like, doesn't my job already give me if inflation occurs? No. You have to have this rider in your um, salary. It's called a cost of living adjustment. I, I, I was saying, like, I know a lot of, a lot of, I, I don't know if my parents both work in cities. And it's like every year they generally get like a raise that goes something similar to inflation. To inflation, but they have to have a cola. That's when you're, when you are, you, most of you work fast food, did they give you a cola? No, they probably give you a beverage, you're like, you get free beverages, right? Yeah. But they didn't give you a cola that as wages, as prices go up, your wage will increase. So let's just say the cost of inflation is 3%. Your income would go up 3%. And this is what I tell my husband. My husband gets to negotiate his contract every year. And I'm like, his pay. And I was like, okay, if the rate of inflation is 3 should you ask for 3%? No. No, because you wouldn't get a real raise. So this is what you have to do if you're able to negotiate your pay in the future. Always figure out what the rate of inflation is and ask above it. So every year I always tell him to ask for 5%. So how much of an increase in his pay did he really get? Two. I take 5 minus 3, he gets 2. And this is what we're going to calculate with CPI. We're going to look at what happens to inflation, how is it hurting us, and how can we benefit from it. So eventually, y'all will all be getting into jobs that you do not wait for them to tell you what your pay will be. You go up to them and you tell them your value, what you have added, and then you ask for this, okay? Don't let them tell you, unless you have a cola, but is, it, is a cola beneficial? Yes, it, but it just keeps up with the rate of inflation. If you're asking for a promotion and they say, well, they'll give you 3%, go look at that inflation because really, will that be a promotion? No. no. Okay, so do y'all see why inflation is important? It's for your pocketbook in the future because a lot of you will be able to, you're probably going into, I don't know what industries, something that you can negotiate. Like I'm in teaching, I can't. They just tell me what my cost of living adjustment and it adjusts. Okay. The teachers in Oklahoma over the past 10 years have not gotten a cost of living adjustment and they were 21% behind because of the rate inflation. Yes. And y'all can't really say much about it either. Because our we don't have a strong labor unit. If I was in California, yes. Well, not only that, but um, my mom works in education as well and uh, they have like a rule uh, stating that you cannot like strike. Criticize. You cannot, yeah, you, you cannot yeah. criticize. Criticize what is going on. We basically mm -hmm. lose our First Amendment rights. Exactly. What mm -hmm. Kids lose that when they come to school too because they tell you how you're going to dress, what you can't have on your shirt, what you can and cannot say within a building because it's that whole security for all. And so I remember when I was in Plano, there was a policy going on that a lot of the teachers did not like. And we weren't allowed to go on the news or be interviewed or anything like that because we do lose that right. And so we really can't, they said it was a cost of living adjustment. And so this is why the teachers of Oklahoma and in California went to protest. Okay. Can't you not strike it? You can't strike as teachers or policemen or firemen or any of that, right? Mm -mm. It, it's Are hard. You fired? Well, yeah, that's yeah. why in Oklahoma they fired, had yeah. to have all of the teachers do it. They can't fire all the teachers. They can't fire all the teachers. You literally and so that's, it had to be such a map, but when 21% of your income has been affected by inflation, they're purchasing, and a lot of teachers were leaving Oklahoma. Do y'all know Ms. Domney? No? Yeah. Okay. She was from Oklahoma, and again, they were like, you're talking about 28,000, and you come in a starting paying job, like in Plano is like 55,000. Talking about $30,000 pay increase, because they had not adjusted for the cost of living. Okay. 